Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. You sound great today. Uh, we're going to preach a message early on in this, in this uh, service. Uh, I'm going to be preaching a message to the entire church family today. So in a new format that we have on Sunday mornings, I'm preaching live the first Sunday of every month, and that would be uh, today. And so I'm going to be preaching in the Great Hall in just a bit. So if you'll go ahead and grab your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Exodus. We're going to preach a message here setting up uh, this series and also uh, really setting up the Lord's table. We're going to continue to worship. Uh, you haven't sung enough yet today. We can't sing enough. And so we're going to be able to sing and praise the Lord and worship Him uh, as we move on into this, uh, this service. So Happy New Year to everyone. You know, this is a great time of the year to think about your life and where you've been, where you are. Now, uh, nostalgia of the past or a fear of the future has no place in the life of a believer. Uh, God is, is present tense. He is here and now and always pushing us into the future. And uh, it's a great time to think about your own calling on your life. Uh, this is something I do every year. We guide our staff through the same to think about what is God doing in your life personally? What are some goals you're going to set? And I hope, you, I hope you're doing that. I hope you have sought to resolve what you might do and set some goals. Last week, we had a message. Really, the premise of it all was if you don't have one magnificent obsession of your life, one priority, uh, one uh, new affection, in your life, Christ himself, then everything else is going to be out of whack. Jesus said it, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else will fall into place. So friends, if you're making, setting goals spiritually, and I hope you are. Some of you are reading through the Bible this year. Many of you are entering into uh, new habits of prayer and, and establishing new habits of worship and coming to God's family, getting in a connect group. Now's the time to do that. And I'm going to encourage you to set those goals. And, and to follow through and to seek the Lord, it's a good time to think, God, how have you called me out? What are the gifts you've given me? And how can I use them to your glory? Because, friends, we've got yet another year to serve him. Let's do so with great urgency this year. So this series of messages that we're entering into is, uh, is one that's going to help us do just that. It's designed to help you uh, look at your life. So we've called it the Moses Model. Because Moses' life serves as a model for us, not because he was a superhero. And I want you to hear this clearly. Our sermons will not be, be like Moses, be like Moses, All right? Work harder, get better, be like Moses. Well, in many ways, you don't want to be like Moses. The Bible, listen, is not a book about superheroes. It's a book about a super God who used ordinary people like you and me to accomplish his purposes. This is why Moses serves as a model. How did Moses, how was it that he was used by God in such a powerful way? Because he was like us. He had insecurities, fears, and worries. He had a sketchy past, and yet God called him out as the greatest, listen, you could argue, the greatest figure in all of the Bible apart from Christ himself. In fact, the writer of Hebrews goes to say that Jesus is the newer, greater Moses. But the entire Jewish faith, the Israelites, God's people look at Moses as the central figure of all the Old Testament. And the central event, of course, is the Exodus. But we're going to look at how God has called you out, how to discover your passions. And today, I'm going to ask you a few questions along the way. Um, and it's going to help you think about some of these things of you, as you enter into the new year. Now, you can go ahead, as I've said, to turn to the book of Exodus. I hope everybody has, has the scripture there open in front of you. We're going to walk through the first couple of chapters, again, highlighting just a couple of uh, things along the way. Now, the word Moshe in the Hebrew, Moses, means drawn out. 
This is really fascinating. He was drawn out from the Nile. Some of you know that story that the Pharaoh's daughter found him after he was put into a little ark, a little boat that uh, his mom made for him. They made for him so he would not be killed along with the other um, newborn males, uh, Israelites. Uh, the Pharaoh had issued a decree that all of the newborn uh, males would be killed. They put him in the, in the Nile. He flo- she, she just saw it'd be better for him to be found, hopefully, prayerfully, than to be killed. And so uh, the Pharaoh's daughter drew him out. Later, she, she ends up uh, you know, giving him to, to a Hebrew a gal that was there. It happened to be uh, his sister. Moses' sister then offers uh, Moses for a season to be nursed by his mom in God's sovereign hand and work in his life. And then this becomes a story of adoption. Really interesting. He's adopted into the Pharaoh's family, and then he is raised in the Pharaoh's courts. But his name really, it means uh, drawn out, called out, and he he personifies uh, his name in his life. This is a fascinating thing. To consider your name. Here's something you can do in the new year. Consider your name. What does your name mean? Your, Your first and middle and last name. One thing I did this Christmas, I took all the kids uh, in my family, my wife included, and, uh, and I took all their names, and, and as a kind of paternal blessing, I decided that I'd write down what each of their names mean, and then a sentence about who they are, who God has designed them to be and called them to do. It's a fascinating thing where we think, well, my name's kind of random. I don't know why my parents named me that. But listen, God's given you a name. And he's given Moses the name and he personifies it. He goes back then, having been rescued, drawn out. He goes back among God's people to draw them out, to call them out of slavery and and into the promised land. So when we look at Exodus, you can see the outline there on the screen above me. We don't have time to walk through all of this, but you'll see where we're heading uh, in the days to come. In the first chapter, you see the oppression of God's people. And we're going to see God hears. He knows what's happening. And then we see Moses' birth, his call and mission, the plagues. We're going to look at that. The Exodus, the Red Sea, uh, uh, the, the moment again in Israelites, uh, the Israelites' history. Covenants and commandments, then directions towards the tabernacle, which will end up then uh, in the, the temple and worship of God, the Davidic kingdom to follow. And uh, now God is, is, is rallying, calling his people together. And so I want us to, before we get to the calling that I'm going to look at today, we're going to look at it this uh, today and then next week, the burning bush experience. Uh, I want you to see there are three stages in Moses' life. Uh, There's Egypt. Okay. Then there's exile. And then there is the Exodus. Now it's interesting to note that each of these thirds of his life uh, are 40 years each. Now, this is going to be encouraging for some of us who are a little bit older, because here's what happens. His first third of his life, Moses spends the first third of his life thinking that he's somebody. And then the book of Acts tells us that he's 40 years old when he enters into really personal exile. He's on the run. We're going to look at that story here in a moment. He murders an Egyptian. He's on the run. He spends the next 40 years of his life thinking he's nobody. And so any of us are at this stage of our lives, even now today, not simply in terms of years, but where we are in regarding uh, regarding self-discovery of our own life. He spent a third of his life thinking he's nobody or somebody. Then he thought he was nobody. And then the last third of his life, he realized, figured out what somebody God could do with a nobody. He finally humbled himself, gave himself over to God's purposes for his life, even when he really didn't want to. And God used him greatly. So what we discover here, um, this is encouraging. Consider this. Moses had already blown out 80 candles on his birthday cake when God called him out to do the greatest work of his life. 80 years old. Friends, listen, here's, here's the truth. God is not done with you. He is not finished with you until you take your final breath. And the story of Moses tells us the latter third of our lives can be the best years of our lives, the most influential years of our lives. If we do the hard work of repentance of sin, self-discovery, personal clarity around his calling, 
Otherwise, we will squander this one and only life that he's given us. And so Moses is going to help us as we do just that. All right. But we learn in Moses what we see in James chapter four, verse six. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And this is why Moses was used so greatly. It's reassuring to see God never gives up on us. Amen. So good. Exodus chapter one. I want you to see the story here. Of course, um, if you know the story of Joseph, the book of Genesis ends with Joseph uh, in Egypt. So he's already there. His brothers come. There's a famine in the land. The 12 sons of Jacob end up there in, in, uh, in Egypt and they start to multiply. Now, you know the story. This is a story of immigration, if you will. And the people start to multiply and Pharaoh is uh, getting nervous. He's afraid. They're growing great in number. And uh, these 12 sons giving birth, their families growing, among others who are there, Hebrews, and they are going to ultimately be the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, it says that uh, now in verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, this is another way of saying uh, he didn't know God. In fact, polytheism ruled the day in Egypt. In fact, every one of the plagues has a corresponding God we're going to see, represented. And uh, the Pharaoh did not know God and he did not know what God had done. And so when that happens in any nation, God raises up leaders. He's about to raise up Moses to say, listen, God is going to show himself great. There aren't multiple gods. There's one God and he is God of all gods. And that's the whole point of this story here at the beginning. It's why he calls Moses out. But here's what I want you to see before we get to chapter three. I want to look at, at, at uh, chapter two, because there is a story there that I think will be helpful for us to discern. How has God called me out to serve him? It's what I call the call before the call. The call event, of course, is Exodus three. But the call before the call is found in chapter two, beginning with verse 11. All right. So look at verse 11. Because we now see that Moses has been drawn out. Uh, and then one day, and again, the book of Acts tells us he's 40 years old at this point. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down. He killed the Egyptian and then tried to bury him in the sand. Well, then what happens is there's a struggle the next day or so. The two Hebrews are fighting. Moses steps in, tries to mediate, and he says, come on, why are you striking your brother here? Why are we doing this? One of them says to him, hey, who made you judge and prince over us? You're going to kill us like you did the Hebrew? Moses realized that when he looked back and, and forth, he didn't see someone saw or knew somehow what happened. So then he ends up a man on the run. This is how he ends up in personal exile, where he finds himself uh, for 40 days really on the run, thinking he's nobody. His past has eliminated him from being used by God. So he thought, well, let me ask you this question. Why did Moses kill the Hebrew? Now, the answer seems obvious, right? You know, he was he was I mean, killed the Egyptian. The Egyptian was 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 trying to come after one of his own. Now, there's this undercurrent of passion within, within Moses. Imagine this. He had seen his own people in slavery in the land. He saw it day after day, I'm guessing, and he just couldn't stand it anymore. Now, this is what I've called the Popeye principle. Some of you know the old cartoon Popeye, the sailor man. You remember him? Now, this is before my day, but we've seen Popeye with his big forearms and his anchor tattoos on him. And Popeye had that moment where he, in every episode, basically, same story, right? He'd get to a point where he would get angry. And he had that line, you remember it. It's all I can stands and what? And I can't stands no more. Yeah, some of you young people are looking around going, what? What is that? You know, um, but this, I mean, this was back in the 20s when this uh, cartoon came along. But, uh, but he, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he just snapped. And he would he would then open up a can of spinach. Right. And then he'd open up a can on somebody. And um, and it was always Bluto. Right. His arch nemesis. You remember Bluto? 
And why they fought over olive oil, I have no idea. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm homely. I'm sorry. Uh, God rest her soul. I, I'm sorry. But uh, they did. They fought over olive oil. Um, sweet pea. That's what he called her. Um, and so he couldn't stand anymore. See, the Popeye principle, my point is here. And the question, you know, we laugh about this. This is, this is very important. This is eye-opening and critical for you. The question is this, defining question. What is it that you can't stand anymore? What is this burden that God's put on your heart? Because Moses says, I can't stand this anymore. And he had to act. Now, he got ahead of God. God was going to use him to rescue not just that one Hebrew, but all of them. So he gets ahead of God. But what is it that you can't stand anymore? Think about that. Because that points you to your call. This is a critical question that I want you to wrestle with in your time alone with God this week. You know, for me, it won't surprise you. I can't stand graceless Christianity. I can't stand cultural Christianity. A, a Christianity that looks more like our prevailing culture than a complete submission, a radical devotion to Christ. That's what our world needs to see is people who are sold out, not to a religion bearing his name, but our pursuits as his people should be a beautiful and stunning departure from the pursuits of this world. And it makes me crazy. And it drives me to preach and to teach and to guide us to respond to the grace of God. What is it for you? And here's what's important. You see, your passion is not someone else's. This can create some tension. In, in the church. I wish everyone was as passionate as I am about my ministry. And this happens. Praise God you're passionate about what you're doing. But don't force it on someone else. They have their own passion. This is the beauty of the body of Christ. We all have different passions and we all have one pursuit, Christ, and then the proclamation of the gospel through our, through our passion. What we can't stand anymore. Don't let that sit there. Deal with that this week and think about it. It'll point you to your calling and then act on it. This is what Moses is going to do ultimately. Well, look at what happens in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. It says, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God knew. I love that. Notice it says, God knew. Friends, God knows what you're going through. He's not forgotten you. And then we have the famous burning bush incident where Moses is out in the fields. Uh, he's Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And in chapter 3, verse 1, it says then that he is, finds himself at Horeb, Mount Horeb. This is, by the way, Mount Sinai. That's why it's called the Mountain of God. It will become the holy place. It's where he's going to receive the Ten Commandments. So he's out there. It's wilderness too, by the way. Even to this day, you can see it. He is out there. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning. This is verse 2. Yet not consumed. Moses said, now watch this. I will turn aside to see this great sight. When the bush, uh, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord, notice in the ESV at least, capital L-O-R-D. I'll come back to that in a minute. When you ever see that, this is, this is Yahweh. This is the name of God. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him. Out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. I want you to notice that when God saw that he turned aside, he then spoke to him. Friends, listen, the number one habit you need to uh, enter into in your life for 2018, the one habit that will change your life is for you to daily turn aside and see what God is saying through, can I say it, the burning bush of his word. He speaks to us through his word. And if you're not in his word, you're not hearing from him. But notice when Moses decided to pay attention and listen, it says, then God noticed that he did so and he spoke. The same is true for us. God speaks into your life when you pay attention to his word and listen. Are you paying attention? He speaks through his word. He speaks through the preaching of his word. He speaks through others in our connect groups and in our lives. He speaks through his, through, through his spirit in our lives. But friends, you've got to put yourself in position, even as Moses did right here. Well, look at what happens in, in chapter 3, then verse 7. It goes on. Surely I have seen the affliction of my people. Verse 8. I have come down to deliver them 
out into a land flowing with milk and honey. The first reference there to the promised land. Verse 9, and their cries come to me, and I have seen their oppression. God sees the oppression of us all. Verse 10, here's the first news that Moses gets of this. I will send you to bring them out. And then Moses responds in verse 11. Look how he responds with a question. Who am I? Who am I? This becomes a key question. And every time he, he asks this question, as he does here, the Lord answers with, I will be with you. Who am I? I'll be with you. What's significance there? He's saying, listen, you're asking the wrong question. First question is not who are you? The first question is who am I? God would say. You see, and even here in North Dallas, we ask this question. This is a question of identity. Who am I? And we pursue all kinds of false identities. I want you to think about this with me for a moment. There's several of them. One is I am in control. No, you're not. You're not in control of your life. God is sovereign over you. He's in control of your life. And the moment you realize that, you lay your life down and you finally see struggling and fighting against him. And he begins to use you in mighty ways as he will Moses. Some of us think, well, I am what I do. I am a doctor. I am a businesswoman. I am, uh, I am an attorney. I, am, I do this until you don't. I am the, until you no longer. You see, we, we place our identity on things that change. It was C.S. Lewis who said, never base your worth or value on something that can be taken away from you. That's foolish. I am what I own. If you are what you own, you'll never be uh, satisfied. You'll be discontent. You'll be depressed and in debt. Or you'll be in debt and depressed because you're in debt, Right? And all of life becomes a worry if you think, I am what I own. I am what I think. This is Moses' problem. I, I'm a loser. I can't do it. We're going to see this in, in, his, in, his, uh, in his calling here. I'm a loser. I have no talent. This was his problem. He's listening to himself and not to God. For some of us, I am what I plan. I'm a new, improved me. Or can I say it? Some of us who are single, well, I am that married person in the future. No, listen, God's called you to live your life now. It's not based on someone else. God is saying to Moses, as he says to us, you are, you are the beloved son or daughter of God. Now on this side of the cross, this is so true. God is saying the first question is not, who am I? The key question here is, who is God? And so I want you to see in Exodus 3, 14, then you know this story perhaps. Moses says to God, who should I say if I'm the one going? Who is this speaking to me? Who do I tell them has sent me? And God answers. He said to Moses, I am who I am. I love this. This is that's the word derivative of the word Yahweh. It's the word Lord. Every time you see it in scripture. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And then he qualifies it by saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the great I am. Now think about this for a moment. He's all sufficient. What does it mean, I am who I am? He's self-defined. You don't define me. I am who I am. I'm self-sustaining. I'm uncreated. I'm self-defined. And watch this, I'm always present tense. Surely he's the God of the past. He's the God of the future. But friends, he is the God of the present. He is surely the God who will take care of you in the moment, in the here and now. And he wants you to focus on right now. He's the God who is undefined. You know, in our day, it's popular to, for us to define God. You hear people all the time. Well, I think God's like this. I think he's like this. I think he's like my loving grandfather, maybe the finest person I've ever... No, no, no. And God steps in and says, no, no, no. I am who I am. Uh, you, your granddad may be awesome, but I am God. Well, I think God is a lot like this. Some of y'all may have seen, there's a movie out years ago called Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell. And in it, there's a scene where he's praying. You might remember this. And he likes to pray to baby Jesus. He just loves baby, cuddly, little baby Jesus. 
And they have this argument and say, well, he grew up. He's not baby Jesus. Why are you praying to baby Jesus? I like eight, eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus. And he's praying to baby Jesus. And, and it's just a crazy story of how everybody's arguing about, well, I like this Jesus and that Jesus. I like my Jesus like this. And God steps into that space and he says, no, no, no. I am who I am. It doesn't, it's not defined by human terms. We're defined by him. And he says, I am. I am the God who is God. And the central question of your life is not who am I, but rather who is God, right? And so this is what uh, God is showing Moses here. I think, you know, Socrates, it was actually the Delphic Oracle that got it half right. Know thyself, okay? It's important. We're going to talk about this in the days to come. Know yourself. Know who you are. Be brutally self-aware. Uh, it's like the guy who said um, he wrote a book on spiritually, uh, emotionally healthy spirituality. And he said, you may have Jesus in your heart, but you've got granddaddy in your bones. Meaning you might need to do some personal work about some of the things in your life, unresolved issues and sin in your life, challenges that you have in order to follow Jesus and to be all that he's called you to do. We're going to talk about that in days to come. Moses had work to do by the way, and he does so. He had a lot of challenges that he had to work through. You know, I've often quoted A.W. Tozer who said, when we think of God, that, that what comes to our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And that's so true. This is where God is saying, listen, be clear. I am who I am. It's not about who you are. It's about who I am. Well, who is God? How do we know who he is and what he's like? Well, the Bible tells us, as we just celebrated Christmas, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word, okay, the divine logos, the word of God, Yahweh, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. How do we know who God is? He's come to show us. We've got a better picture than Moses did. Jesus comes and he says, you want to know who I am is? which can literally be, in the, in the Hebrew, it's more, I be who I be. I like that. I be who I be. And so what happens is Jesus comes along. People tell me, I've, I've been in conversation with folks, you know, Jesus didn't really say he was God in the flesh. I mean, he talked about being one in purpose with God, but he didn't claim to be God, not really. Listen, John chapter 8, among other passages, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he says, hey, listen, before Abraham was, I am. And then the next verse says that they picked up stones in order to kill him. They knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I am Yahweh, the great I am, the God of your man, Moses. That's who I am in the flesh. So the great question then for us today as we lean towards the Lord's Supper is is what Jesus would say in Mark chapter 8, verse 29. Who do you say I am? So friends, as we set our hearts on the Lord's Supper, I want you to consider the fact that the great I am has come. If you've received his grace, he's rescued you from your sin. He died on the cross uh, for you so that you might know him and give your life to him in response. So I want us to pray together. And I'm going to ask you during this time, the rest of this service, that you'll ask the question, Lord, what have you given me? What gifts do I have? What am I passionate about? What is it I can't stand anymore? And then how will I serve you in the coming year? This can be a defining day for every one of us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, I thank you for how you have spoken into our hearts. And I thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself in Jesus. And I pray during this time, Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, that you will remind us of your great love for us first. Not who am I, but who are you and what have you done? And I pray that every one of us will respond in obedience because your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us. You rose again from the grave so that we might live resurrected lives on purpose for you. And I pray it all In the mighty name of Jesus, the great I am, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. 
If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.